I apologize for that. But I still think that it was just simply the car guy talking to Ed about Sam or talking to, or talking to Sam about Ed. It was just that simple of a thing. I think we have to call Claudio. How do you like that? I would love to speak to Claudio <laughs> about this. I think I the think... story was all the same to everyone except Sam. Because Sam <laughs> No, no, really, really. I think every the story is pretty much exactly what everybody says, except Sam knows that maybe he got a little assistance from Claudio. No one else knows that but Claudio. And that's easily hidden, that's for sure. Because if Sam, you know, threw a little spinach on the ground. For Claudio, and Claudio just mentioned it to Ed, then he got the ball rolling. Who knows? I'm just telling you. All right, move on to the next part of the letter. And then he says here, David Marconi's calling you out. We hear the story that Claudio talked to Sam after speaking to Ed. Ed lays out the story in the first Eddie interview clip I attached. Ed says that Claudio just got done talking to Sam on the phone. He doesn't even mention anything about what the call was about. From other interviews, Sammy did have a car at Claudio's too, so the conversation was probably about the car, or perhaps Sammy told Claudio to mention his name to Ed. (laughs) <laughs> this goes on and on. He goes on and on, and we have well, to. We have you to know what? If, I, if I got point. again, if I got if I got the details wrong on the timing, right. then I apologize. But in my defense, I certainly have not gotten the truth any more wrong than Sam did. Well, you know, he goes on here to talk about that about Sammy's comments about jump and he, that he is separating the music from the lyrics and he likes the music of the song but it's something that grabs him at a primal but he didn't like the lyrics of singing it listen the bottom line is this Sammy took the job as the lead singer of Van Halen. Van Halen was already an established and accomplished entity with hits. If he didn't want to sing them, he shouldn't have taken the job. Listen, don't go sign up to work for Nabisco and tell everybody you don't like cookies. Do you understand? You can't. I hear you. You're, you're right. It's simple as if, that. If you don't, if you don't like the elves, then you shouldn't be working at well, Keep. That's exactly, exactly. So, okay, we are on to the next section where he talks about the Right Now remix. He's saying this is not an alternative version with a keyboard solo in the place of a guitar solo. This is a mix that is just missing the guitar solo. That keyboard organ is present in the version with the guitar solo as well. You can't hear it because the guitar is rocking on top of it. And then he says this must have been an accidental mix release when they were grabbing the wrong version by mistake, kind of like what happened with the version of Running With The Devil, the first cut of the best of Van Halen 1, but in this case... It was a reordering of the song. That is obviously not the case from our last letter, who was a DJ at a light FM station who had a keyboard version of the song. Right. So that's that. We're we're chucking him down here. And then he says here on the next section, I can totally see why Ted Templeton was surprised when Eddie wanted to record 1984 at the 5150 Studios. I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that the building started out as a garage and when he converted into studio at that time, home studios were not prominent. Also, it wasn't finished and when they started recording, so I'm sure Ted thought, why don't we go to Sunset where we have everything ready at our fingertips? But Ed was remembering his frustration with the last two albums, playing covers on Diver Down and sneaking in at night to record his guitar parts on Fair Warning. So they were looking at the situation very differently. Honestly, this is what I think. I don't understand how Ted could not be in tune to Ed's frustrations. Ed is the backbone of the band. He had to realize Ed needed to make a move. And Don knew everything that was going on. And Don was Ted's partner. I believe the big breakdown was between Don and Ted. And there are missing missing pieces there for freaking sure. Right? What do you think, Dave? Yep. Okay. Yeah, because if they were talking then Ted would have definitely knew from Don, oh, no, Ted, let me tell you, Ed is recording the next album there. This isn't just a place for him to jam. Exactly. Like, he's all in on this. Exactly. How could he not know that? Okay, let's go on with that. He's telling me, yes, Michael McDonald was the co-writer at All Wait. All of us who called that out earlier in the episode were right after all. Okay, yes, Michael McDonald was a co-writer on All Wait. Let it be known to everybody who listens to this podcast that Michael McDonald, the keyboard player and singer for the Doobie Brothers, 
He was the co-writer of I'll Wait. All right, so on to the next section. He's concerning David Lee Ross, Crazy from the Heat EP. He says, I am not surprised that Ed and Al felt betrayed. I remember reading an interview with Ed where he said he took a lot of crap from the rest of the band for playing the song Beat It because at the time the band had a strict policy restricting band members from any outside projects without a blessing from the rest of the band. I think this was started around the time that Gene Simmons was trying to lure Ed and Al away. But I think this is why Eddie didn't take any money for Beat It either. He was trying to keep it under wraps, thinking Thriller album wouldn't do much. So when Dave and Ted come in with his solo EP of Dave, why wouldn't Ed and Al feel betrayed? I don't doubt that Ed and Al felt betrayed, Devon. However, I can't understand how the hell Ted Templeman kept that entire project from the band. How could the band singer and the band's producer, and the band's record company be working on an entire project of that magnitude and no one in the band knew about it. I don't understand that. That's a mystery to me. What do you think, Dave? It, yeah, it does seem... I mean, unless they were just so out of it and not caring and, you know, they were told and they forgot. I, I Look, I don't... Dude, or, or, it's or just whatever. too big. And, and by the way, I think I think the reader, the writer's name is, is Devin. What did I say? Devon? Yeah, it's not it's not like Levon. It's It's D V O N. I think it's Devin. Wouldn't that be an I N then? I'm Devin? well, maybe he'll write in next time and Devon tell us how to pronounce his name. Do, I, do, I, no, I don't think so. All right, all right. Listen, Devin. Devin, Davin, whatever. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> listen. So we're going on to, to the next section. Finally, if Don Landy is so good at mixing bass. Because he talks about that in the book. Ted Templeman talks about how good he is in mixing bass. Then what happened to the bass on Diver Down? The bass is even thin on 1984 and Women and Children First. And if you count all the albums Don Landy mixed, I would say at least half of them, the bass is buried and it's thin sounding, with the exceptions of Van Halen 1 and Fair Warning. You're not going to get an argument out of me there. Agreed. There's not enough bass for sure on all those Van Halen albums, especially. Well, oh, I think there's two. enough bass on women and children first. All right. I think that's unfair about that all album. All right. All right. Well, I mean, but, but, but the one he didn't mention was OU812. He didn't mention that, but I will mention that. That's for sure. All you into it's okay. like non-existent. That's for sure. And then he says here, sorry for the long letter, a lot to unpack, but I want to thank you for the shout out on the Balance album. He says the mix is fantastic and the songs are overall great on the Balance album. His favorite is Aftershock. He says it's a killer guitar solo. And he truly loved Eddie's guitar tone, but after this album, it started to sound too processed and crunchy for my taste. I think the reason you don't like it, is maybe because he switched to the Wolfgang after that. Didn't he switch to the Wolfgang after the Balance album? Oh, I cannot keep track of which guitar he was using. I don't know. I, I think it was. I thought he was using Music Man during Balance. I'm not sure, but I, I think it was. I, I forget the chronology okay. of that. Well, that goes on. Devon Miller, he says, keep up the great work. Hey, I look forward to your podcast each morning. I can't wait for the, each episode. Devon or Devin Miller. D period Miller. There you go. Well, listen. Mr. Miller. My God. Mr. Miller. It's Miller time after reading that whole fucking letter. So listen, uh, letter number five. And we, we're on to letter number five. And letter number five comes from James Minutella from New Jersey. All right, James. Well, James says he is a 31-year-old millennial who was brought up on classic rock from hearing it in the car with his parents, listening to his dad play VH tunes on guitar. Good for you, bro. He says he loves all eras of Van Halen, but really loves Sammy Hagar as the lead singer because he took the band to the next level with an expanded vocal range and musical talents. Now, he has a few questions. Number one, what exactly happened with the mixing for OU812? I feel like half the album is missing. The missing bass really hurts the album. And he thinks Cabo Wabo is highly underrated. And he also says, are there any unreleased semi-tracks I should be looking for? Where can I find them? Number three, he also asked, what would be the best Sammy era song ever? For me, it's Dreams. It's untouchable. It's just a powerful song. By the way, he thinks one way to rock live performance from August 19th 1995 is unbelievable because they go into Foxy Lady and then House of Pain. He says they really look like they're having fun, and he sent us a link for it. James Minutella from New Jersey. 
The James Minutella, the millennial. Wow. Well, James, yes. Uh, Dave and I say that all the time that Sam is great and, and we, we love him. He did also mention in his letter that he, he likes that Sam played guitar on uh, some of the earlier uh, uh, portions in Van Halen, when he not on the albums but on the live shows, and Dave and I do like that as well. Uh, in regards to your questions, OU812, yes, it is a mystery what happened to the bass on OU812. Don Landy, I don't know what was going on with him, but he, he totally dropped the ball there. The entire character of that album would be completely improved. It was just remixed. Cabo Wobble is one of my all-time favorite songs. It is the ultimate summer song for me, along with Top of the World and, and Summer Nights. I think those songs are fantastic. And I used to listen to them in my car all the time in the summertime. In terms of two unreleased Sammy songs, I got I Want Some Action for You from 1986. And also crossing over from 1995. I sent you both links in an email, James. I hope you enjoy those. One well, crossing week. over was released. Well, yeah, it's released, but it's not It's not readily available. I'll tell you that much. It's not on fucking Spotify, and it's not, okay, on, it's not on iTunes. I mean, you got to really search for it. So, you know, it's released in Japan, but like, you know, there you go, James Menutello. There's not a lot of unreleased Sammy. A lot of that no. stuff is still in the vault. Very little of that has leaked out. It's in the Iga vault. <laughs> it is. It's in the Iga vault. Vault. Right. So it is. It is. But seriously, it's yeah. at fifty-one fifty. Right. But you know, or, you know, there's yeah. a bunch of songs that Sam or or maybe other members of the band have referenced over the years. The, Definitely, Sam has. Well, the, but none of that yeah. stuff has ever leaked out. The one song that I know that they fully did with Sam. And never released was Between Us Two, which was the second song for the Twister soundtrack. I do not understand for the life of me why that never made it. I don't know what the hell. There's there's also apparently some sort of scratch demo on a song called Drop Down from the... We talked about that, on, about the Twister soundtrack. I don't know what... Those will never see the light of day. Please. You gotta be kidding me. It'll be on the Van Halen box set coming yeah, out any day now. Coming out in, in, in 2050. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, oh, I meant to say our friend James Minutella, he wanted to know what was the best Sammy era song. What is your favorite Sammy era song? Uh, I'm going to have to go. I'm uh, going to go with Pound Cake. Pound Cake? I'm going to go with 5150. Oh, excellent choice. There you go. Letter number six comes from your favorite, Dave, Brian Costanza. Can't stand you. That's right. Thinking back to the balance episode, what about a what if? If you know can't get this stuff no more is a leftover from balance. Can you imagine the album with this song and what song would it best replace? Oh, my God. Well, it looks like we're going into an episode, Dave, of what if. Now it's time for what if. With Dave and Dave. Shit, what if? What if? Dave Marconi's favorite segment, What If? What if, motherfucker? I don't do what ifs. Well, I tell you, can't get this stuff no more. I see it more as a bluesy instrumental. I do not see Sammy singing on this song because he already rejected it, by the way. Apparently, according to Sam, he mentioned it, that it was a, re- a reject from Balance, for right. sure. I would replace Doing Time and Strung Out. And if you want to put a, a bluesy instrumental in there, call it uh, whatever you want. With that song, that's fine with me. What about you? I'd get rid of Not Enough. And if you want, if you want to put the Sammy version of that song on there, then do it and drop Not Enough. That's all, folks. <laughs> Okay, letter number seven comes from Mikael Bowden in Gothenburg, Sweden. And he says here, Hi, Dave and Dave. Hope the quarantine in the end brings something good with it. For example, you have time to make even longer podcasts. (laughs) Oh, lovely. Well, we have been making (laughs) longer podcasts in the quarantine for sure. So he says that uh, it's a long letter, but I'll, I'll shorten it a bit. Because uh, Dave gets cranky if I don't. So he says he was 11, 12 when he picked up the 1984 Van Halen album. He thought they were the coolest band he's ever seen. And he's always gravitated toward the Dave era Van Halen. 
And he finally lost interest sometime after the For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge album. Unfortunately, he says he's never seen Van Halen live, but he got to see Diamond Dave in 1991 in his hometown of Carl's Kloga. He was excited about that. And he says, I think Van Halen sometimes gets unjustly criticized 